Hello, everybody, and welcome to What is Truth, episode 78. We're finally playing with a full deck of tarot cards. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Whoop. What is Truth, I got, episode I got another one 78. Going here. We're finally playing with a full deck. <laughs> Just in case you didn't hear it the first time. Well, that it actually fits into what I thought would be interesting to discuss today with uh, His Grace Archbishop David William Perry in London, and I'm John Barnwell, and I'm here in the D greater Detroit area, Detroit, the Straits, on the border of Canada. And in looking at, at the, our world, so much is, is uh, facing us on a level of challenge, and many of which just isn't so. And so we have to try and improve our, our toolkit, so to speak, our understanding of, of how the world works from a spiritual scientific viewpoint and that that can give us insights because we weren't born with really uh, an instruction manual and so we're dwelling in a realm of tub fight or dullness and that's very challenging that's that early grail mood of parsifal when he's just a bumpkin and he doesn't really know anything that's us myself included. And the whole goal of the grail path is to be able to make a transition from tumfite, from dullness, to salda, or blessedness. And so it's my hopes that, that we might find inklings that promote that kind of a vantage point. Now, in, in thinking about today's show, I was... Uh, going back and forth about different subjects, and they all kind of synchronistically, they constellate all by themselves. And so that's kind of world in which I live. Things seem to fit together. But I received an email from Dr. Yuri in St. Petersburg, and he's discussing a thing that he had received regarding uh, this individual, Harry Salman, talking about what's going on in Central Europe at this time. And uh, he said that it's basically, I'll summarize, in that he said that uh, he did a very good presentation based upon the conventional sources of information that he's referencing. But in addition to that, uh, Yuri brought up some really uh, important points to understand that area of the world, that central region of the Slavic souls. And so he says, first of all, one has to take into account the church reform of 1666, when the Jesuits managed to dismantle the true spiritual life in Russia. Since that time, all religious life of the Russian people till now could be rightly identified as imitation. Rudolf Steiner points out this in the following way. Before the church schism, the reform, during the service, the Eastern Slavs could contemplate in the spirit the presence of spiritual hierarchies, angels, archangels, so forth in their environment when the ceremony took place. After the Nikon reform, they could no longer contemplate the representatives of the spiritual world as, as before. Thus, one could indicate the tragic 1666 as a turning point in the destiny of the Russian people. For before that time, there were two attempts by the Jesuits from Poland to ruin the Orthodox Christianity in Russia and substituted with the Catholic one. From the beginning of the 17th century, the Jesuits made two unsuccessful attempts to install the fake Tsars in Kremlin. 
so-called false Dimitris. Nevertheless, the Russians had the ability to distinguish and resist demonic forces, but after the reform in the absence of a true spiritual life in the country, <clears throat> the enemies of Russia managed to implement the false Peter project. The so-called Peter the Great is a project of external hidden, hidden circuits of power based on secret Jesuit brotherhoods and Masonic lodges. Since that time, Russia has lost its sovereignty and has been ruled by supernatural national structures. Uh, there's much more, but uh, an interesting quotation is from uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and he's referring to uh, the secret historical archives in Russia, where he's asked, when will they get access to the secret historical archives? And uh, he made the point that uh, they would need to wait at least a half a century. Otherwise, the world will collapse. So you see that there's that whole uh, nexus of falsehood. And, and one way we can look at that is, is the concept of the enantiomorph or the mirror image. That when you, when you hold up a spiral in a mirror and you look at the reflection, the spiral is going in the opposite direction, isn't it? Or if you take the, a page of a book and you hold it up to the mirror, all the letters are backwards. And actually, there's a certain truth expressed there because in the astral light, if you look at uh, a page of a book, for example, it's the same thing. It's, it's reversed. And so this whole concept of reversals present on that level, but it's also present on, on more than, than one level. And it ties into the three great axioms that were presented by uh, C.G. Harrison back in uh, the late 1800s. And that was uh, in his book, The Transcendental Universe, Six Lectures on Occult Science, Theosophy, and the Occult Faith. And in, on page 46, he says, three great axioms. Seven is the perfect number. The microcosm is a copy of the macrocosm. And third, all phenomena have their origin in vortices. And so when you, when you look deeper at that, it's not just that there's a vortex, but that there's an inverse vortex that uh, is the counterpart. And so you have uh, the working of, of evolution according to the understanding of the outline of occult science has to do with these this idea of the affirming and denying is one aspect of it and so you have this natural pairing but in an unnatural way because of the conditions of earth evolution are so uh, we've descended so far into matter that once we get and start to pick up the impulses of, of Michael, then we can defeat these things and you can, you can read it. Let it be done, fiat justitia. And so the threefold image of spirit, soul and body is, is the crux of this issue that, that I'm discussing right now. And if you go to 869 AD in the, in the church council, they said that a human being was a being of body and soul, but that an individual didn't have a spirit per se, but he could have certain, he or she could have certain spiritual qualities, but they didn't possess a, an independent spirit. And that's directly in contradiction to the Pauline doctrine. So there's been this whole tendency arising from 869 in the ninth century, that counter image of, of the grail that is striving to, to rest from the, the levels of spirit and soul, uh, human evolution, and lead us into a, 
a material destiny, so to speak, whereby materialism, Rudolf Steiner said, could become true if we complete our separation from the worlds of soul and spirit. And so that's very much the challenge in which we're facing at this time. And in fact, our good friend, Leo Zagami has his new book out, volume seven of Confessions of Illuminati, from the occult roots of the great reset to the populist roots of the great re reset. And uh, so I finally got my copy and I'm happy to say that he does a characterization of Lucifer and Araman in here and he, he does it correctly, however brief it is, but I was concerned whether or not that would come through and it did. So I'm, I'm very pleased and it's, I, I really don't know people uh, that have the grasp of current machinations of occult organizations and of the church and all of that, like Leo. So it's a very special book and it's available in both paperback and hardcover on Amazon. So there, Leo, I gave you a plug and I'm sure you're busy right now writing volume eight. But in any regard, let's, let's say hello to Archbishop, His Grace Archbishop, David William Perry, who still kind of wobbles when he hears himself referred to in that light but it's out of respect for the office that I say these words. Hello. Afternoon, John. Um, actually, my one is a head scratcher because I'm a pacifist. Uh, God, God knows where you got that piece of artillery. Um, oh, oh uh, um, actually, I'm more than an archbishop. If you go to my uh, um, Gnostic lineage i'm actually a full tour uh tau which is ooh, it's a bit like a cardinal stroke metropolitan since we're talking about senior metropolitan so since we're talking about orthodoxy um and that wasn't easy that was not easy <clears throat> um i've been talking about that non-stop recently i don't know why um yeah but uh, afternoon cock nice nice to see you um, my usual sort of desperado image after uh, uh, our service of worship, sadly, we can still only do one a month at the minute. There are financial reasons behind that. There are tactical reasons behind that since we don't want to upset anybody at the building where we're church sharing, you know, yada, 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 yada. Um, so we won't be seeing the actual mysteries of Easter there, which is a shame. So we prepared for them this afternoon and that was kind of a lot to get through. Um yeah, I mean, who knows more about all this stuff than Leo? I mean, though I'm not sure what I think of the eyeball staring people out. I mean, yes, I mean, surely he's made his point without that thing on the front. Um, we, we all know how knowledgeable he is in these spheres. Yeah, you know, there's no need for that. It's the eye of Mordor. <laughs> Did you know that's exactly what I was thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Giving us all the ones over. And, um, oh, oh, yeah, but I've got to, I've got to burst a few bubbles, and this is with the deepest respect. Was it Professor Yuri? I can't remember. I can't think of a time when the Orthodox churches haven't claimed they were always on the ropes, year in, year out, century in, century out. It doesn't matter who the protagonist is. Let's talk about it from a different angle. The fact they all hate each other, they never stand together. And they'll, they'll cut each other's throats given half the chance. And they're nationalistic in the worst possible sense of that word. Um, I don't write off that word. I think there's a soupçon of interesting stuff there. Um, but let's face it, that word has a well-deserved history. And they are it. Um, no, no, and there's never been a time when the Catholic Church wasn't taking over Holy Mother Russia. There's never been a time when... The czars, sod the czars, get some democracy. Sorry, John, yeah. All oh, right. So, yeah, sod them, sod them. Yeah, get rid of this medieval obsession. Um, yeah, there's never been a time. Je right, Jesuits at the minute, what was it 500 years ago before they started? Yeah, there's always something from the West that's, that's you know, draining Mother Russia dry. No, blame your bloody selves. Talk to each other for a change. Stop trying to carve up all the territories between yourselves. 
And, you know, try and remember your Christians. How about that for a start? Um, you know, are you the original, you know, are you the original way Christians did it? Let's, let's face it, no. They were Jewish. That's not the way the original Christians uh, worshipped. Um, you know, are you very early in terms of liturgical worship? Yes. But you're not the only ones. There are other, there are other prime examples of that. And I'm sick of this self-pity that comes from that part of the world where everybody's draining the Jesus Christ of nations dry, Holy Mother Russia. I nearly swore then. Grow up, grow up. Um, I did, that's how strongly I feel about it. Um, no, no, no. And Putin's on his last legs as a martyr who's trying to bring back Holy Mother Russia and, and you know, the whole world's against him. No, 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 no. Um, I do admit that the press over there is saying very different things to what the press is saying over here um, to uh, about certain problems I won't go into at the minute, certain issues. Um, and I think, weirdly, the I, I mean, everything's propaganda now on both sides. I mean, was it that bad during World War II? I don't know. I don't know. But surely somebody somewhere must have been telling the truth. You know, the, the Russians can't really understand. I've asked them why the West is getting involved in this battle in the first place, because as far as they're concerned, it's a Slavic issue amongst Slavs. Um, they don't understand why the West is being vehement. I do understand because I've got very, very great friends in Belarus and some very great colleagues in Belarus. Um, why it's making everyone else nervous, and nervous is probably the wrong word, you know, sort of shaky. Um, I do understand that. But, you know, I, I think if we stop being Anglophone-centric, if that's not a mixed metaphor, um, and try and think, you know, well, how do they see things? You know, we know what we think, but what do they think? I mean, certainly gossip in Moscow, as of a couple of days ago, because I still talk to them, was what's the West on its high horse for? And I think there is something to that. There is something to that. I'm not saying it is an, atro an atrocity. I'm not saying it isn't completely unacceptable. I'm not saying uh, that, you know, this is completely unwarranted and wicked and should never have happened. The invasion of wherever should never have happened. But what I am saying is the narratives on that side of the world are so markedly different that we have to be quite careful over here that we're listening to what they're saying amongst themselves. And also it's linked in with this hyperbole about, you know, fading orthodoxy, holding the last ray of true Christianity between its teeth before it finally gets knocked to the floor by everybody else, by Muslims, Buddhists. I can't remember too many Buddhists doing it. Muslims, Buddhists, Jews. You know, oh, they're all against us. They all hate us. No, take five minutes looking at the history, the religious history of that part of the world, and anyone can see that's not the case. And it's the, 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 the depressing history of triumphalism gone wrong. Um, and that, for me, is where... This nonsensical quasi mythology really has to be brought into check. Um, you know, is the Catholic Church constantly trying to undermine orthodoxy? Probably. Um, is orthodoxy doing the same to the Catholic Church? Of course it is. That's called human nature. That's the way the cookie crumbles in this particular dispensation. Does it mean it's right? No, it doesn't mean it's right, but it means they're both wrong. Um, one isn't the innocent victim of the other. And let's look at the czars. I mean, they're highly, you know, saints, all saints, John, rather like the kings of England, all saints. Gosh, and don't we know it here? What was it, Charles, king and martyr? That bastard, They were the parliamentarians were trying to make a deal with him all the way up to the gallows with a team of lawyers. And the arrogance of that man was he would never, ever make a deal. And history itself would end if they laid a finger on him. Well, we're all still here, aren't we? 
you know, so if, if I ever am in a Church of England church, I never, ever sing any of those things. I can't bring myself to think that these potentates, that these powerful men telling us all how we're meant to think, believe and, and, and uh, behave in life have any connection with sanctity, with religion, with spirituality, because they simply don't. And it's the, the, the czars are even worse. I, I shall now shut up before I get, get, get too worked up. What do you think about that tirade, John? Well, yeah, it ties into some of the, the uh, things that have been going through my mind leading up to uh, this here. I'm, let me dig up something here. Hopefully I'll pull up the right thing. No, of course not. <laughs> here we go, where we are. Well, let's, let's go into uh, something to lift us a little bit. Our, our friend Johann Wolfgang von Goethe says, none are so hopelessly enslaved as those who falsely believe they are free. The truth has been kept from the depth of their minds by masters who rule them with lies. They feed them on falsehood till wrong looks like right in their eyes. And uh, to which I heartily disagree. So, and if you think you could just go to school and, and straighten it out, you're in for a big surprise because that's really one of the worst places where history has been rewritten so thoroughly that you'd have a hard time s sorting through it all. And that's a lot of what we try to do over at American Intelligence Media with Tyler and Douglas Gabriel, those, those stalwart souls that have been working daily for years for nothing. I mean, meaning for, for no money involved, they can afford to do that, bless their souls. And their coworker, Michael McKibben with Americans for Innovation. And there we've managed to, through uh, an extensive uh, groups of researchers been able to compile primary documents to try and set the record straight on quite a few issues. And so I, I have the links below. And if you want to try and, and sort these things out for yourself, and you can, if you have your own creative bent, you can source those materials. You don't have to worry about giving any accreditation. You can reshare any of it. You don't have to worry about any claims of copyright or anything like that. But in, in that regard, check that out. And uh, But in looking at this more closely, it goes back to what I brought up before about the, um, the Ura Linda book that was translated in the uh, 19th century out of Old Frisian, uh, which was an old Nordic language of Denmark. And in there, they, they, one of the main themes in the book is that they're being assaulted by this group coming from the East that they refer to them as the name stealers. And that whole idea of falsification and, and disrepresentation or uh, limited hangouts is a, is a new term that's coming to the common parlance. And that's where you manage to distract enough people to pay attention to the story you're telling to keep them from digging deep enough to find out what's really going on. And uh, it's, it's such that way. I mean, I, I recall a conversation that was, was put forward by uh, a very significant individual in American intelligence. And he's talking about when he brought uh, Henry Kissinger into the State Department and Kissinger was like considered to be an expert on Russia and all, all of those things. And when he came in there, he was told, well, there's, there's uh, 20 or so degrees of, of, of top secret above your level of clearance. And now that you're, you're being brought in, you'll be able to find out that 
most of what you thought you knew was wrong. <laughs> and so that's the state of, of, of how we look at the world. And uh, so we have to take off the goggles of mass media and, and do put out our own efforts to be able to get to the bottom of this. Because remember, this whole show is based on a question mark. It's an open set. It's not a closed set. We don't assume that we have all the information. We're just trying to improve our questions here. But in getting into some of the, the things that, that are, are related to this and, and tying into uh, C.G. Harrison's comment, comment about the, the spiral nature of, of manifestation. So you see that you have uh, in Rudolf Steiner's scheme that he presents, and it's not really Rudolf Steiner's scheme, it's, it's his presentation, but it's, Rudolf Steiner once explained it, that, that why do we have to deal with such uh, difficult concepts like, you know, old Saturn, old sun, old moon, evolution, and, and, and all of these things. And Rudolf Steiner said to the effect, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, but that uh, this is Christ language. This is language that we need in order to come into a relationship with certain ideas and concepts that relate to the development of the Christ impulse. And so that's the key here. And, and he also said that the, in the Occult Science, the Outline, the central book, that all of which I'm sure you've read, but the central book uh, that present, presents his, his uh, cosmology and anthropology is that he said, were he to give that book another name, it would be the grail. And so that's what it has to do with. It has to do with this whole idea of how through the enantiomorphic or mirroring process, the universe came into being and that that matter isn't isn't really real in the sense that we uh, think it is. That it's uh, an enantiomorph of the world of of soul and spirit. It's it's a reflection, so to speak. It's all done with mirrors, as they say. And so, uh, but if we overly identify with that reflection, then when evolution moves on, that passes off to its own destiny as the eighth sphere. And that's something that's not a happy uh, event for the people that have been fooled by Lucifer and Armon into believing the lie. And so it's very important. It, I talk too much, you know, and I know that the more I talk, the more I get myself into the brambles of falsehood. And so that's the problem because we have limited knowledge and so we're continually saying things that aren't true just based on the fact that even if we're trying as hard as we can, nonetheless, we're going to be presenting things that aren't really true in the, in the truly real sense because we don't have all the information. And so that's part of what we're doing here is trying to uh, fill the gap a little bit Maybe, you know, we use a little sticking paste and chewing gum at times, but we managed to uh, get into the brambles of falsehood. Yeah, the brambles of falsehood. Yeah, we'll, we'll post that up there because that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, oh, no, I don't want to put it. In, oh, there it is. Oh, there he is. The brambles of falsehood. And so uh, that's basically what we're doing here. Isn't that correct? Your excellence. <laughs> I think Oswald Spengler is angry with me at the minute. I'm sorry, Oswald Spengler, if you're angry with me <coughs> from Miguel Connor's show the other day. It was only a gag. It was only a gag. Um, you know I love you. I love everyone that follows all of our work. Uh, we're, we're a gang. Uh, we're all a gang. I really do see it that way. Um, oh, you, John, John Bono trying to get hip on me. Right. Um, I've shouted out from hangouts. You know, I, I've had gas on the open sea. I, I know a, a thing or two about blockchains, matey, which is unusual at my age. Um, 
Oh, right. Let's begin with backtracking a little from my tirade against orthodoxy. Um, it is beautiful. It is holy. It's deeply religious. It's deeply spiritual. The liturgies are breathtakingly lovely. Um, the other side of it is my problem, not uh, not uh, the practical worship side. The, the worship side of orthodoxy is a lesson to us all. I mean, and certainly, oh, John Burnwell thinking I'm just going on about Blavatsky all the time. If we think of what Blavatsky said, um, where, you know, she she goes too far. She always, she can't resist going too far, which for me authenticates most of what she's saying. Um, you know, she had it verified from the masters of the secret wisdom that underneath all of the pointless apparatus, there was a genuine, you know, arcane and spiritual route to Russian orthodoxy, which led to the, you know, the source of things. I can, I can believe that. I can believe that. Um, and, you know, she ended up in one of the letters, I think to one of her aunties, I can't remember which one offhand, it's in my notes somewhere, um, that she's ne she'd never ever said a word against uh, Russian orthodoxy, which of course is true. And I wrote something recently about the fact she had a very complicated relationship with Russian orthodoxy, um, not meaning she was constantly trying to backtrack and explain herself, meaning that she'd, she'd always defend it by keeping quiet, um, which is another route. That's another, that's another tactic. You know, so she's having a go at everybody else, but apart from Russian orthodoxy. Um, John. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, on a liturgical level, it, it's, it surpasses everyone else. So don't get me wrong. On the level of aesthetics and spiritual aesthetics, it's, it's beyond, beyond peer. It's beyond peer. But the other side of it mustn't be forgotten. Um, oh, you said lots of things again. Oh, my God. I, all right, I, I don't know enough about American intelligence media, but, but thank God I'm finally seeing messages at the bottom of my screen. Um, I suspect if we're looking for deeper truths across the board... This is turning into a debate. I'm sorry. I can't follow it step by step. If we're looking for, for deeper truths across the board, I mean, in, in their modern form, I mean, we can clearly go much, you know, much worse and much more. We can't go far away from Rudolf Steiner. We can't go wrong if we stick with him. Um, there's such a an incredible depth. I don't know why people in Britain, or I'm only talking about Britain from the ones I've talked to, so it's not been a survey, it's not been an empirical inquiry, you know. You know, nine out of ten accountants said, so no, I can't I can't say anything like that. Um there tends to be an attitude to anthroposophy here. I mean, I, was it I'm so punched up with shows I can't remember. You know, in Britain, I think the attitude is you need three PhDs. To be able to, to be able to understand anything that that's ever said at Rudolf Steiner House, um, the attitude—they may have a point. The attitude it, it, to European anthroposophy is it's just one, it's just another huge organisation oppressing us all again. So that's your typical Germanic view of anthroposophy. They have a point, um, and I don't know. I, I think the the American view tends to be sort of volatile. In, in a way I don't fully understand, because what is anthroposophy? A cultural and philosophical society. <laughs> I, I can't understand why people have difficulty grasping that. Though I suppose if you're from the born-again belt, um, I'm not attacking all of them, but you know, some of them think the slightest jot and tittle from a, away from what they think means you're a screeching heretic. Um, no, I mean... <laughs> If we're looking for, for, for deep set truths, if we're looking for something beyond the media, if we're looking for the reflection of the reflection, I mean, uh, certainly in terms of the dark art, uh, which I don't know much about, but I've known one or two people who did. Um, what caught my attention in a, in a talk I went to years ago, I used to shy away from those things because... Normally, it wasn't to my taste, obviously. And, and second, it was always about getting butt naked 
and doing whatever you wanted to on drugs. And I remember thinking to myself in those much more innocent days, I, I, I was a much better figure in those days, by the way. But, you know, does anybody really want to see me butt naked? So, you know, there's a, so I used to drift away. Um, you know, even Austin Spare. I mean, I, right, on the level of art, I relate to him. On the level of occultism, I do not. Um, you know, so, you know, there'd be, there'd be a meeting, there'd be a lecture sometimes that maybe I'd, I'd end up feeling uncomfortable in, normally about people like Austin Spare. Um, and which Patterson, uh, what was she, the ugliest woman in the world? What does that mean? You know, what does her husband think? You know, thank you, thank you for that description. Um, but, you know, sort of, so he's getting at the crone image, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and it went, you know, these things always went too deeply into dark and, and from, my, from my perspective, obviously, completely sterile waters. I mean, is there such a thing as a Vamamag? Um, is there such a thing as a left-hand path? Sadly, I think there is. Um, otherwise, certain things in history simply aren't explicable. Do I think equally there's a right-hand path, the path of light that goes beyond the left-hand path, the path of darkness, and straight into eternity? Yes, I do. So I don't really understand why one would risk everything in a, in a willful fashion to achieve what? I mean, you know, one of my, oh, God, John, you've got to shut me up. Uh, I like Dennis Wheatley. I like Dennis Wheatley. I'm not always just reading Proust. I like Dennis Wheatley. And I like what he had to say because it always tends to be, you know, the, the plain man's version of occultism. Uh, I don't think, I don't, never thought you were completely incorrigible and everyone should read Steiner. Um, you know, the plain man's view of, a, of occultism. And it was where he would he'd sit in some of his talks. I mean, people forget, how, I think I mentioned this before, how posh Dennis Wheatley actually was. You know, when he's not doing doing spy thrillers. I mean, he's meant to have been the guy that gave the impetus for 007 and, and that genre. He's meant to have actually laid the ground for that. You know, so we, and if he's not talking about British military history, you know, the fuzzy wuzzies were here. And everybody else was over there. You know, you get that side of Dennis Wheatley. And this endless wine tasting about, you know, Chateau, Chateau Free in 1740. So that, that's sort of the, the Dennis Wheatley that sticks with me. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about Dennis Wheatley, a cult writer, and there isn't as much of that as people think, and certainly not compared to the other stuff he wrote. Um, You're you know, hearkening. You're hearkening me back to the days of my youth when we used to drink Chateau Lafitte Rothschild out of Dixie cups. <laughs> How did you afford Chateau Lafitte? Oh my God. Well, back then it was different. It was before Keith Richards drank most of it up. See, he's one of the single most uh, responsible people for the increase in price of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild because that was his favorite. Uh, drink his favorite beverage in in the expensive winos was his the name of his band in fact but uh, he's not particularly posh like uh, dennis wheatley uh but probably the nicest guy of the whole bunch uh why did i get into that oh you're talking about dennis wheatley yeah he's an interesting character i mean so is that whole uh uh I'll have a martini shaken, not stirred. Is that a Wheatley-esque allusion? I, it could be. Uh, you would be more knowledgeable regarding that than I would. But was he married to Joan Grant? Really? I now that I don't know. I don't. I don't know enough about his personal biography. Although I have read some of his books, but it was so long ago. You're really stretching my limits here, David, which is one of the reasons I enjoy talking to you so much. Utterly mutual, sir. Utterly mutual. Don't worry. I, I regard you as a very good chum and a confederate, if that word is still allowed to be used. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a great show. It's a great show because everybody's stretching everybody's boundaries. It's great. I'll finish my, my weekly point of hand back. I mean... I don't know why he's on my mind. He's actually on my mind a lot at the minute. You know, talk, uh, in India, do they talk about a Vama Marg, a left-hand path 
yes, they do. What it seems to be, at least on the surface, and I do think there's a supernatural, and I do think there are adepts that deal with the supernatural forces that they interact with. You know, what, what the, the visible people in the Vamamag are doing are actually just going against the taboos of the right-hand path. In other words, the Vaishnavas, the followers of Vishnu, the followers of Krishna. Uh, you know, they're going against the taboos of Hinduism, if there is such a thing. There's a huge argument there. Um, and they feel that that liberation will somehow increase the clarity of their consciousness. Um, again, but but I'm a, I'm a, a nice white light boy. I'm, I'm not walking that path. I'm walking the other one. I disagree. I don't think it can be done. Dennis Wheatley said uh, on the dark path, people withered and died. On the light path, they thrived and prospered. I think that needs to be remembered. And really, that's the bottom line of all his books on occultism. Um, and anything that tries to confuse, disorient, um, anything that tries to hold down is simply wrong and at the service of the dark forces one meets along that path. To, to finish off the initial point, how do you, I notice from some of these talks, how do people, they say, uh, cancel black magical incantations they read the incantation in reverse so you read it it's in all its horror uh out sort of in in the way that you do to begin with but if you want to cancel it you have to read it in reverse so that is almost the reverse of reverse so i'm i think this is something odd and interesting that we're both falling into anyway handing back to you john because you're looking for plex and i imagine Messages are coming through. No. Um, what was I saying? You know, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, look, to look at what's before us in a, in a wonderful, clear light, that really is what's important to expand one's consciousness. Right, it's in The Devil Rides Out, um, which is one of my favourite books, and not simply because Christopher Lee, remember Chris was among, one of my mates years ago, was the, the Baron de Richelieu. Um, I think he did a fine job, actually, as a white magician. Um, you know, they're, they're, in, one, in, right, in one of the scenarios, the hero Rex, this sort of tough boy, who used to shake his cocktails and not stir them, ha uh -huh, uh, is talking to Tanith, one of the um, initiates of MacArthur, who's clearly Alistair Crowley. Um, and I, I think... You know, I think Big Al, did he ever know that? I think he'd have liked if he didn't know that. <coughs> you know, because Rex says to her at one point, right, okay, you were, you were interested in occultism. Why not white magic? Why not do white magic? And she says to him, I think something that's really telling. Um, the white adepts, paraphrasing massively, the white adepts are always talking about becoming one with the universe. My God, what a terrible thing to talk about. You know, they're always... They're always describing how you become, you know, you achieve cosmic consciousness and that sort of stuff. And this character in the book didn't want to do it. What she wanted to do, I quote partially, is see the results of her work. Isn't that interesting? Uh, even though the work was dark and led downwards and ultimately to the destruction, the servitude and destruction of all those involved. I think Dennis Wheatley need, needs reviving because um, he can tell a good yarn and a few home truths at the same time. John, my friend. Yeah, well, I, I, I looked it up a little bit. You know, I, I enjoyed uh, Joan Grant's occult novels and Dennis Wheatley. And, you know, you could also add in Dion Fortune. We call her here. You call her Dion. Uh, that's interesting. But uh, yeah, Joan Grant, uh, in the uh, views that you get of Joan Grant and Dennis Wheatley, one point is made, which I think is, is really relevant, is that they are two of the individuals most responsible for bringing about a popular reassessment of the concept of reincarnation. And I think that's really true. You know, it, there wasn't that many writers getting the kind of wide appeal that these two writers, because of their skill, 
were able to achieve. And so they brought those concepts to a wider audience. So that's, that's, that's very interesting. But um, that being said, they were not married. They were very good friends. Although Dennis Wheatley's wife was named Joan. And that's what made me think a bit ab about the idea of them being married. But no, they were not married to each other. But uh, he did a great deal to help promote her career. And so that's a good thing. But see, as usual, we fall down the rabbit hole. Yes, live long and prosper. <laughs> but in any event, uh, I, going back to uh, this whole idea of an anti-amorphic pairing, you can look at it even in terms of biology, where you like, let's say, for example, you have uh, alpha tocopherols, vitamin E, right? And it's 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 a right-handed spiral uh, chemical compound, okay? But there's also L-alpha tocopherol, and that's when they they synthesize it, and it's it's a left-handed spiral. So any of the functions that the alpha tocopherol would perform in your body, which are very important, you need vitamin E. Were you to take the L-alpha tocopherol, because it's it's a an enantiomorph, it's a, a mirror image, it's a left-handed spiral. Uh, all the cell receptors that would be accommodating alpha tocopherol would not be able to accommodate the L alpha tocopherol because it's kind of like you go to the you go to the the uh, locksmith and you tell him, yeah, can you make me a key? And 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 you give him your key and he cuts it on the opposite side, and then you get back home and you stick the key and it won't go in the lock because it's it's. Uh, it's an enantiomorph. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mirror image of what it should be. And so that's kind of like the way it is with, with falsehood. There's, there's nothing real in the world to support it. And Rudolf Steiner goes as far as to say that, that when you lie, something in the world dies. And so if, if, you, if you could see auras, then when somebody's lying, it's like they're, they're like a, a squid squirting ink into their into their auric field. And so people that are frequently liars or BS artists, as they call them over here in the States, they tend to have very kind of murky auric fields because the words that come out of their mouth have no connection to the real world. And so that's something to keep in mind because another level of enantiomorph is when you pass away, you get to go through your whole life in reverse order through Kamaloka, but you get to experience what other people experienced of you. How's that for an enantiomorph? If you made somebody feel bad, you get to feel what they felt like. So hopefully that can, can bolster your moral evolution. <clears throat> Gosh, yeah. you, you have a habit of saying absolutely gigantic moral statements, which I never know how to respond to. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all this transhumanist stuff, isn't it? You know, anything apart from being human, anything apart from being a half decent human being. Um, I mean, a lot of occultism is actually to do with that, which is why I don't understand the, the dark path. A lot of the white path is to do with being a decent human being. Why is that so wrong? Why is that so terrible? Why isn't that more productive? I mean, certainly in Central Asia, that they would say they spend a lot of time working on their relationships as opposed to you know, jobs or careers. Or why would that be wrong? I think that's inc excuse me, incredibly healthy. Um, yet we say die on fortune over here. I, I don't think it's a, a plot. Um, I, I'm i a huge admirer of hers um, on all sorts of levels. I mean, apart from Big Al's nasty poem about her being a lesbian, shut up, mate. Shut up, yeah. People in glass houses, shut up, yeah. So, right, you can see I'm on her side, okay. Um Mind you, it was funny. I mean, the story goes 
that she was walking in full ceremonial regalia um, across Hyde Park, thinking she turned herself invisible. And if anybody's ever walked through Hyde Park, you know, if, if you ever see anybody like that, all you do is turn away as quickly as you possibly can, because you don't know what you're dealing with. OK, so admittedly, it was all linked in with that sort of stuff. But no, I what a tour de force. I mean, certainly I love her novels. Um, I'm thinking primarily of the Goatfoot God. And it's so well done. It's so well structured. I mean, there's real craft and imagination in that book. I'm not the only person amongst the, the literati here, if that's the correct expression, um, to think that she should have put more time into her novels because she would have been one of the great novelists. <clears throat> but, you know, who can who can take away from her work on the Kabbalah, who can took, take away from her work on the theories uh, uh, of white magic and, you know, the, the hives she's talking about, the secret nectars she's talking about, and the New Avalonians. I mean, I'm trying to actually build a group on top of everything else, called the New Avalonians. I mean, she was one of the leading lights in in uh, the previous Avalonians. They believed that the Grail had to be found and restored in Glastonbury um, for Britain to get back on its feet. Otherwise, it wouldn't. Please, can we find it now? <laughs> it really needs to get back on its feet now. <clears throat> and, you know, we needed to re-enchant, I'm paraphrasing massively, forgive me, re-enchant the, the landscape and our, our cultural, socio-cultural relations for, for life to become livable uh, much longer. And of course, curiously, the very things she writes, you may disagree with her, her cure, but the very the diagnosis is correct. Um, you know, she was with some real luminaries like Tudor Pole, Rutland Bow, the composer. We've talked about Tudor Pole, of course, uh, before. And, you know, some... <laughs> Some incredible people trying to look at British history, the mysteries of Britain, the matter of Britain from the perspective of white magic, which is probably what got a big owl's nose, um, and make it a, a workable social force. I, I think that is a remarkable thing. Um, <clears throat> and the fact she was open largely as far as you could be in those days without being arrested. She was a, a, a stalwart figure in fem feminine rights and female education. Um, and, you know, she's she, uh, a prolific authoress. Uh, yes, I like I like L-E-S-S words still. Um, how does it take away from her being a great writer? Uh, you know, no, we need we need more people like her in this neck of the woods. We, we need a, a dying fortune back. We need her wisdom. We need her insight. We need her, her cunning and her cleverness, as well as her, her talent. Um, no, I think I'll hand back to you. Otherwise, I'm going to eulogise Don Fortune for the next 10 minutes, which isn't good. But as I say, that that group, uh, the Avalonians, really is worth looking at. There's a book about it which doesn't really go much into the membership, all the achievements of that group. I mean, certainly Rutland Bauer, the composer, wanted to put on sacred opera uh, in Glastonbury based around the mysteries of King Arthur. Um, that stuck with me uh, when I first read that through these years from a teenager, because that would be staggering art, and that would be on the level of Bayreuth in Germany with Wagner, um, easily so. Uh, but anyway, nothing has come to pass yet, and we need to remember that that spirit has yet to be reorganised. Handing back, John. Well, I see that time is marching on. And so I didn't want to forget to share with you the writings of uh, his eminence, written before he became so eminent. The Grammar of Witchcraft, and that is a Shakespearean study. It's not a how-to book on magic. And his second volume is Shakespearean as Poetry, Caliban's Redemption. And his major work is, speaking of orthodoxy, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg, and the Arts, edited by 
very talented Daniela Erendust. And uh, these are all available for you on Amazon. And you can order them there. And uh, such a talented writer. Right? What can I say? He's this gentleman is so multi talented. He's so humble that unless I ask him, you wouldn't get to find out all of his numerous accomplishments. And he hates when I blow smoke up his dress. But uh, I'm the author of two books. The first one is 640 pages The Arcana of the Grail Angel. The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian Order. It's got a forward by my buddy Douglas Gabriel of American Intelligence Media with great many extensive diagrams, the complete series of diagrams is reproduced in my second volume. These are based on diagrams, uh, handwritten diagrams of Aaron Pfeiffer that crossed my desk many years ago. And so I titled them Grail Diagrams and they give you uh, all the various facets of the conversations we're inclined to have here. And uh, my books are available on eBay from me directly, or you, if you're outside the United States, continental United States, you can contact me through private message on Facebook or with the link below that will take you to my academia page. And there's links there. And you can contact me through there also. And if you wish to uh, buy us, a cup of coffee uh, for our efforts here is greatly appreciated. No amounts too small. You can do that through paypal.me forward slash D P A R R Y seven 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 or for myself, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell eight eight eight. And also, uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that this pos podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla, Vadim, Vivian, Neil, Christian, Mark, Ma, Druvman, Laura, Paul, Rick, Michael, and so many others over the year. And so thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. There, I got through it. I didn't forget. I don't think. So in that regard, what I've been doing lately is I've been translating this book, uh, Landmarks in Cultural History by Sigismund von Gleich. It's a three volume thing. I'm just working on volume two because I'm delving into further studies in, in the mystery of the Queen of Sheba. And so there's very little available in English. And so I guess I'm gonna have to do it. And so that, that should be interesting. That's going to impact my third volume that's forthcoming if I live long enough. <laughs> and that being said, I'll, I'll just come back and write it, finish writing it in my next incarnation. And it'll have the added viewpoint of I'll probably reincarnate as a woman. And uh, you know, you have no more than seven incarnations in, in any gender. Okay, there are people that because of certain tasks, they keep reincarnating in one gender or another, but uh, the general tendency is enantiomorphic in that you go from a male to a female and back and forth. In fact, you can think of one male and one female incarnation as a complete uh, entelechy itself. So that's, that's a thought to think of. The, and that through a deeper understanding of the principles of which we discuss here, and it's available in the work of Gus Steiner, you can find yourself uh, entering more deeply because if you accomplish moral imagination, that brings you into the ability to be able to perceive uh, your earliest childhood, except you'd be as little children. 
if you bring it into moral inspiration, the Christ realm, this is the Holy Spirit, the Christ realm will bring you into experience of the world before you were born. And that's where you can come into relationship with your previous incarnations. And then the moral intuition, the realm of the heart. And that's the, the higher level of will, the realm of the father. And when one develops initiation to that point, then you be, begin to be able to perceive the old Saturn, old sun, old moon evolutions, and, and even perceive into the future Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan periods after the Earth is no longer in existence. And so that's initiation. And, and enlightenment is just the first step. So those that think that the end all is enlightenment, no, uh, not according to the teachings of occultism. And But that being said, it'd be great if uh, Reverend David could consecrate our efforts here, our humble efforts, with a prayer. Of course, he usually has something to say before he goes into his prayer. As usual, I've got something to say before the prayer. Um, I have a couple of gags, actually. Um, my my favourite reincarnation joke is actually by Woody Allen who said, right, all right, we all know what went wrong, but the point, he, he can still be funny, that in his next incarnation, he wanted to come back as Warren Beatty's fingertips, which I thought was summed up Hollywood, actually. <laughs> um, and it shows he hasn't lost it. Um, and, oh, uh, do I want to say the rest? Um, yeah, I mean, the whole bedrock of reincarnation is in a pregnant subject and really needs addressing seriously and i'm not going to drone on about it because i think we need to do it as a show properly john that would be mind-blowing i mean it's one of those things that drifts in and out of my own work from time to time i tend to go down the metempsychosis route rather than reincarnation but that's that's a personal a personal bugbear more than anything else Anyway, my friends, this is the fourth Sunday in Lent. Next, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday, which is Palm Sunday. Uh, we've got to remember that it was the very same people who were waving palms on one Sunday were actually driving nails into palms on the Sunday afterwards, which says something about the human condition. Um, do we all need to repent? Yes. Do we need wisdom in what it is we repent about and on what level and to ourselves or to those around us? That is between us and Christ. My friends, let's approach through Lent, through the time of abstinence, through the time of reflection, the great existential mysteries of Good Friday the ontological mysteries of Holy Saturday. Swedenborg talks about uh, Christ harrowing hell, an ancient Christian tradition, and saying something quite remarkable. Was there anyone left in hell uh, after our good Lord went there and returned? Certainly, he was one of the first people to point out in modern language that Holy Saturday so Friday is the death day of our culture. All cultures have death days. Saturday is the transition day, the holiest day of the whole year for a Christian. When life comes out of death and we celebrate that resurrection on Easter Sunday. Would you pray with me just one moment? Oh my God. Relying on thy infinite goodness and promises, I hope to obtain pardon from my sins this Easter. The help of thy grace and life everlasting through the merits of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Redeemer. And may those thoughts guide us in Lent, because Lent is coming to an end. 
may they renew us in Lent and may they give us the vigor necessary to embrace the new self that is promised on Holy Sunday. My blessings and prayers are with you until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, kind sir. And I look forward to uh, having another journey next Sunday. <laughs>